Hello, we are In Conversation, a podcast from the School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University, designed to showcase timely and informative insights from leading faculty, researchers, and other experts, which impact the ever-changing social world we live in. Here at the School of Social and Family Dynamics, we recognize that the land where we are hosting this conversation at Arizona State University belong to the Maricopa and Pima peoples, and we are privileged that we can welcome you to today's conversation. Welcome, welcome everyone. My name is Aubrey Hoffer, and I am your graduate student host of In Conversation with the School of Social and Family Dynamics. My superb guest today is Dr. Steve Elliott. Dr. Elliott is the Mickelson Foundation Professor here at ASU. He received his doctorate in 1980 in educational psychology right here at Arizona State University. And he's been the faculty at major research universities, including the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Vanderbilt University. In 2010, he returned to ASU to lead the development of the Interdisciplinary Learning Sciences Institute. And we were so happy to have him back. Throughout his career, Dr. Elliott has authored nearly 300 journal articles, books, and book chapters, along with a number of widely used behavior rating scales. His research focuses on the assessment and intervention of children's social and academic achievements. He's also just a really interesting guy, which is why I'm so interested and happy to have him with me today. Steve, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, hey, Aubrey, thank you. Good fun. Thank you. So Steve, let's get right into it. You know, you have such an interesting, expansive CV, and it is so cool to just read about all of the great things you've done in your career. But I want to go to the beginning. Can you tell me a little bit about what you were like when you were a student? And did you always know that you wanted to go to college and get a PhD? What was that decision like for you? Mm -hmm. Well, how far back do you want to go, Aubrey? <laughs> you as know, far Aubrey. back as you want to take. Oh, uh, well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a rainy day uh, when I was born. It was Christmas day of 1952. <laughs> we won't go too far back. Um, but um, I do, um, I, I, I think a couple things about my uh, upbringing. First off, I, I grew up in a small town in Michigan. Um, I um, love going to school. Um, I really did. I, I look forward every day. I, I miss very few, I don't know, maybe five days of school. Four of those days I had to chicken box or something when I was in third grade. Um, but so I didn't miss school. Um, and uh, so schools is kind of a center in many ways of, um, of my early life and athletics were too. Uh, I was, uh, you know, played football as a quarterback. I played basketball. I played golf. I won, I won the state championship in Michigan when I was in 10th grade and 11th grade in golf. So, uh, and and uh, I thought, hey, I might be able to be a professional golfer. So uh, I went to Michigan State and uh, had an invite to walk on to the golf team. Um, and I learned that literally you had to spend about six hours a day practicing golf at Michigan State if you really wanted to be good. And I didn't have that in me. <laughs> so uh, concurrently, I, um, uh, as an undergraduate, I had a terrific experience in psychology. I still remember to this day sitting in the uh, first or second row of an auditorium that seats about 400 students and listening to a social psychologist by the name of Bill or William Crano. Um, and he's still alive, actually. And um, William was a spellbinding lecturer. And it made me so interested in social psychology and psychology in general that um, I had sort of been on a path that I thought like maybe like a lot of kids my age that I, because I was reasonably good student, well, I could be a medical doctor or something. But as soon as I heard that, I said, that's the kind of stuff I wanna do. And so from the time I was a freshman in college, I did, I, I pretty much set my goal to get a graduate degree. I didn't know if I could, didn't really know if I could earn a PhD and um, if I'd be worthy of it in psychology. 
But um, so I, I did, uh, I, I worked, I got married when I was an undergraduate. I'm still married to the same lady, Anita. I think we're about 47 years now. Um, that's, a, that's a good predictor too, uh, in terms of stability in life. Um, and I, um, I had to work while I was in graduate school and I ended up working at a juvenile detention facility because I could work there from Friday night to Monday morning, and then I could go to classes. So I actually had to stay at the facility. And um, yeah, it was boys and girls, lock and key, a lot of uh, uh, runaways and corrigibles. My guess is many of them had been abused. That's why they ran away. Um, but some of them lawbreakers. But the gist of it was I started finding out that, first off, these students still had to do schoolwork in the school. The local schools would bring their um, homework and that to them on the weekend. And I ended up helping them with their schoolwork. And I started learning that most of these kids at the time had, I didn't know exactly what their problems were, but um, had a lot of difficulty learning. And I would say that the majority of them had learning disabilities of some sort. Um, and, um, but I found it really interesting to work with. And so that led me to saying, aha, I think um, I, I'd like to go to graduate school and, and get something to do with education and psychology. And, and I didn't really know the territory, but because um, uh, I had all my undergraduate workers in psychology or the natural sciences, not education. Well, anyway, I went and got a graduate degree in educational psychology at Michigan State with the goal of being a school psychologist. And I'd have been really happy, I think, to get that degree and to um, work in the state of Michigan. And again, along that path, I, um, I had opportunities to learn some to earn some money and I started helping people who were working on their doctorate with their dissertations. And so a couple of them I was with quite a few days a week and I was going out to schools and helping them evaluate kids and listening to, them to talk about it. And I went, hey, I think I'm as smart as these guys. <laughs> maybe smarter. I, I think I could get a PhD. And so um, that changed my, my thinking, literally. It was kind of an issue of self-efficacy. And I, I, I usually don't lack self-confidence a lot, but admittedly I did. I wasn't sure if I had what it took, nor you know really what it meant to, to get a, a PhD. And so that was uh, like 1974. And it was in the middle of the year, kind of I had this epiphany. And uh, uh, I, so I went to Michigan State, I had, and I, I, I did like all four points in that. I said to my advisor, I said, I'd like to apply to the doctor program. And he said, well, you just missed the application deadline. I go, what? <laughs> I'm, I'm in the program. I just, I'm like, now you missed the application deadline. You have to wait on it. I said, you've got to be kidding me. So I said, I'm looking elsewhere. And uh, my wife was uh, also looking for an MBA program. And lo and behold, we ended up in, in Tempe, Arizona. Um, and had never, never been to Arizona in my life. My wife had, that, that was part of the, she'd been out to visit a sister and that. So lo and behold, we, we landed in, uh, uh, we drove out here in the middle of the year and I started in 1975 in grad school in educational psychology. And um, a very fortuitous event occurred at that time too. Another man and his wife from Australia came. His name is Brendan Bartlett. Brendan was a, uh, a national scholarship, had won a national scholarship of Australia. He was about five years old or six years older than I am. And he, in Australia, many professionals um, work in universities, teach, etc., with a master's degree. And so he's coming back for a doctorate. So he really actually knew the university landscape much better than I did. And so we buddied up. And um, we're still mates to this day, okay? Um, in fact, I talk with them quite, quite often, just on the phone with them this past weekend. I've been to Australia 40 times, uh, and it's been intertwined with research and writing, although the two of us have rarely done research together. We have different interests. Um, but that was, that was um, a watershed for me because we, we, he really pushed me as a peer uh, he was an exceptional writer, really gifted writer. Um, and, and he could write really funny stuff as well as really scholarly stuff. And um, I learned quite a bit um, from being around him. 
And also at that time, I had a course in Aubrey, you know about this course because I'm, I still mimic it largely today. And it was a course um, that was a feared course. It was called Research Epistemology and Technical Writing. And of course, this was, this was before computers. Uh, this is, you know, you turn stuff in on paper and you would get red ink all over it. Um, from uh, the famous uh, austere professor, uh, Keith Van Wagen. And, and Keith still lives in Tempe and is, is um, I think about 95 now. But Keith is a terrific, terrific scholar. And um, he created a, a very simple course in a way. And Aubrey, again, you've, you've had parts of this, which is pick an exemplary piece of research that's been published. Defend it. Why is it exemplary? Write, write about why it's exemplary. Once you've done that, then your task is to rewrite the entire article. Okay. And during the course, you had to use Ms. Dr. Van Wagenen's method of writing, um, which has stayed with me to this very day. And um, although at times it kind of grades against some issues with APA, not radically. Um, and, and what I learned from that point forward that really has been empowering to me um, it took a while, though. I mean, I wasn't a ball of fire when I came out of grad school, but it is that writing clarifies thinking. And so it, if you have something you want to think about, a research project, uh, for example, write. Um, too many people, I think, read too much. <laughs> it sounds antithetical to, to an academic. Now, of course you read. And, it, and of course you read um, a, a number of things, but ultimately you write about the, the really critical studies, not the 50 studies you read about, the three studies that made a difference. And anyway, so that was, a, that was that's the early days. I, I, I found that I was fairly unusual in that, um, uh, as an at young academic, none of my peers had had a writing course in graduate school. Um, and um, there wasn't a place for me to teach it. And my first academic appointment was at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Although they said, yeah, this would be great. Your graduate students that you work with and mentor will really benefit from that. Okay, fine. I was there three years, uh, had no graduate, uh, no, nobody graduate with me at the time. I wrote several articles for students. I went on to LSU and worked for four years. That was another really fortuitous event. Um, I got recruited to LSU and um, by a man by the name of Frank Gresham. Frank is a colleague of mine. He's now retired professor emeritus and, um, at, at LSU, although he left and came back to LSU. Um, Frank came to me and said, um, I'm, a, I'm looking for someone to help me with a research project on kids' social skills. So I was sitting in Nebraska, he was at LSU. And he actually had a very stunning early career, a total career really, but an early career. He, his master's thesis was on children's, the assessment of children's social skills. His dissertation was on that topic. You rarely find somebody that's so singularly focused their entire career. So he had a career of 45 years in academia. In, 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 Everything had to do with kids' social skills, social behaviors. Anyway, I didn't have that interest. I had more academic side interests. My dissertation was on reading and metacognition. Um, hardly have visited that since then, uh, which is another message to any grad student out there. It the, the first, I don't know, let's, let's arbitrarily say the first five years, graduate school and five years out, it's all about the process. It's all about uh, or, or exploring various paradigms, and, and that's your program of work. Um, uh, people will ask you when you go out for a job, well, tell me about your program of research. And then usually people make stuff up. I, I was asked that question when I interviewed at Nebraska. I said, I don't have a program of research. I've got a strategy to get one, though. <laughs> so so I, I told them what I was doing and how I was going about it. I guess I convinced them because they hired me. Um, but, that, but going to LSU was critical because uh, Frank wanted me to do some stuff on the first research area. 
And I didn't see the connection. He did, I did. Um, my first bona fide research area had to do with what was called treatment acceptability. And it, it really is a notion that um, parents, teachers, others make decisions about interventions with kids and they, they, they weigh several factors. And I sort of explored that. What were the, what were the deciding factors? At time, uh, it was a big one. Um, philosophy about child development, uh, philosophy about the use of punishment versus rewards. There were a number of variables in there. Anyway, I created a measurement tool for that. Still used to this day, it's fa fascinating. I never published it. I mean, I published lots of articles on it, but it's never been sold. And people all over the world write me for that. Medical field in particular, very interested in treatment acceptability and sort of the whole logic is that if it's not acceptable, you get very bad compliance in terms of implementation and then the effects are low. So there's a conversely, if you, if you do find it acceptable, you get higher imp implementation and greater effects. And so it's, it feeds upon itself. So anyway, it's a, a 15 item little scale. But Frank said, well, I, what I see in all that stuff is, has to do with social validity. And I'm looking for someone to help me identify the social behaviors that are critical in kids' lives. And um, I said, well, I'm, think we can do that and I I wasn't sure actually <laughs> but but, uh, but we did and and it led to the development of uh, of widely used but no longer sold as of last year um, instrument used all over the English speaking world called the social skills rating system and I won't bore you the details of that except that it led to another instrument, a better, superior, psychometrically sound instrument that was also tied to an intervention program. And that was called the Social Skills Improvement System. And Frank and I started that work in the mid 80s. We published the SSRS in 1990. We revised it, um, wanted to a lot earlier, but test companies, once the test is making money and doing well, they don't want to touch it, they just let it go. And so we um, actually revised, it became social skills improvement system in the mid 2000s, 2000, 2000, came out in 2007. And, but we did that work from, for about four or five years, big national standardization studies, et cetera. An interesting little fact is I've, uh, I've never had a federal grant on social skills. Um, you don't need a federal grant on social skills if you've got a measure like that and you have huge standardization data sets. So it's um, now I've had federal grants. I've had for 37 years, I had federal research grants, but they're all on other topics. Um, and uh, uh, so I've kind of had uh, two streets, uh, private money through sale of product and huge data sets. And lots of people would share data sets with me on the SSIS because they needed help with analyses or interpretation or something. So probably published a hundred articles or more, just yeah, for sure more than a hundred articles on social skills and mostly social skills assessment. But over time, social skills intervention became big. And then in, in the mid, in the mid to, well, in the mid 210, 210, 210 about, I started a gig working with the educational testing service. Um, they asked me to be on a, Stand, what they call a standing research panel. And I started um, going to ETS in New Jersey and Princeton, New Jersey, three times a year, spending three or four days there working with other people. And one of the guys I came across to work with is a man by the name of Roger Weisberg. And Roger founded a, an organization called CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, which is kind of the flagship um, institute, advocacy, a number of things to deal with kids' social emotional learning. And uh, we had a number of conversations about it and he knew my work in social skills and measurement. And I knew his work on kind of prevention and intervention. Long story short, he was telling me about this new model, uh, a theoretical model that they had that looked at five elements of kids' social emotional learning. And I. You know, I had, we had great dinner conversations in there. And I said, so who's done the empirical work on this? Um, assume there's like a confirmatory factor analysis. He looked at me, he said, nobody. 
I, he said, it's a theory, Steve. And I said, well, nothing wrong with that. And he says, that's right. And she, I said, but you know, I think I got a bunch of data that we could really test that theory. And so I, I went home and I called up Frank and said, do you want to run these analyses with me on, on, uh, on this new model? It, would, it might change how we look at social skills because we always looked at social skills as involving communication, cooperation, assertion, empathy, responsibility, engagement, and self-control, actually seven areas. And, um, and then we refactor analyzed it and lo and behold, we were able to get really four of their five factors in the new Kessel model that's actually used all over the world. And we were the first ones to do that. And our article came out in 218, we did this work in 216, and it takes a couple of years to get it up. Um, but it's, it's been, that became another launching pad for a whole bunch of work and, um, and a whole bunch of learning on my part. I knew almost nothing about item response theory. And so I had to learn something about item response theory. And the best way to learn for me is to find somebody who's really good at it and mentor me. Uh, I can read books. I don't like to read. I told you, I like to write. <laughs> so I do read and I did read quite a bit. But um, anyway, that's turned into a whole new line of assessments, very brief assessments that are used for universal screening. I'm trying to stop there, Aubrey, <laughs> a little bit. So I went from Hillsdale, Michigan, on a rainy day being born in December, to my current experience. I don't know. Did I lose you along the way? I left a little of Wisconsin out in there. Um, and that's actually one of my all-time favorite places. I was on faculty there for 17 years. And it was it was life-changing uh, experience. So I could say more about that. Well, thank you, Steve. That was really wonderful to just hear, you know, you really did give me a great picture of where you started and how you got to where you are now. And I think that's incredibly fascinating. Some of it's luck too, as you notice, it's like unplanned. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, one thing I was hoping to talk that you would talk a little bit about is your writing process, because I was fortunate enough to take your scholarly writing class. And I am just so amazed at the process in which you write. And I think that there's so much great advice that you can give for, you know, not just graduate students, but faculty listening, even undergraduate yeah. students. So tell me a little bit about the writing process. How many projects do you have going at one time? How do you balance everything? When do you know when to say no to collaborations? Give me a little bit of that. Okay. Well, there's a lot of questions here, Aubrey. Um, <laughs> well, sure, I think- you I, have going at once? Yeah, I, well, I, I, I like to have, and I think you have to, when you're a junior person, um, a, a graduate student or a junior faculty member, because there's, um, there's a lot of pressure to publish. And there's a lot of pressure to, um, I think, uh, get a program of research that's identifiable. And they, and they actually go kind of hand in hand, because I think the more programmatic your work is, the uh, the more attractive you are to other people to work with because you've got some boundaries on what you're working on. You've got some definition, so you've got some good measurement, et cetera. And, and you've heard me talk about this, but I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the, uh, the notion that it takes four or five, six studies before you kind of know anything. Um, you can have a publication and I'm not saying it's trivial information, but to get a big picture. And I often use uh, an example of pointillistic paintings or, uh, as a way to do that. And all the dots before, to get the big picture, you gotta have 15, 20 dots. Um, and so, uh, so I'm a team, I'm a team player. Um, I write very few articles by myself. I might have, if you look at Vita, maybe 10, maybe 10 single authored articles of nearly 300. Um, uh, I'm liking to write more by myself as I get older. Um, and I think maybe some of that is just, it took me 40 years to get some confidence. <laughs> but, but, but so teamwork's important. I think one of my assets is 
then I, I have an organizational plan. I know where I'm going and as a writer. Um, and give or take one or two, there are 15 critical thought units that you have to uh, master in terms of writing a, a, a complete research, database research article. And you, you know that. So um, you know, everyone knows there's an intro, there's a method, there's a results, there's a discussion. Well, um, all of those can be broken down. And the, and the easiest one to talk about is a method. Say, yeah, sure, you got to write about the participants, you got to write about the measure, you got to write about the procedures and the analysis. Yep, you do that. That's simple. But what ties all those together across all four of those has to do with your, your suppositions or predictions that you make. And that's the infrastructure that everything is built around from the intro, um, the rationale for the invention of the problem is about understanding the previous research, everyone does a bit, but that's really presuppositional. And those are, and the suppositions are your predictions or hypotheses. And then you have to have a rationale for the solution of the problem. So there are two rationales you have to master to be a writer. What's the rationale for the research problem? Rationale for the solution. And once you've done that and you've articulated your predictions, you, I can, and you can, Aubrey, you can too, because you've been in the class, you can go to the board and you can write the APA style headings, an outline, if you will, for an entire manuscript. And um, you can do it. And then I can throw out some variables and say, these are the independent variables. These are the dependent variables. And then you can start embellishing those headings with those variables, starting with a rich title and, um, and then moving through the entire manuscript. And so um, not only is that at these 15 units, in particular, the, the, the notion about four elements to a research problem, useful as a guide as a writer, but it's also a useful template for analyzing the existing literature that you want to play off of to write about. So that I learned all that from Keith Van Wagen in that graduate class. That was the most important class I've ever had in my career. It's a huge difference maker in terms of my productivity. I, I, I left, I left, I told you this story. I left graduate school and and my goal was to, I thought, this is this is it. This is my goal. I want to write one book. That'll happen late in my career, because I'll know something. And I want to have 20 or 25 really good articles. Okay. And I want, to, I want to teach courses and have some graduate students that go out and become academics. Well, after 41 years, um, I think I've got 32 PhDs that I've shared. 22 of them are in academia. Um, doing all sorts of great stuff. And the good news is I still write with a lot of them. So that's a sign of productivity. So the writing engagement that started in graduate school, in some cases it lasts for 25, 30 years with some people. You can track them through my Vita, okay? Ryan Kettler, uh, Andy Roach uh, are, are two that, that jump out. Jim DePerna, Christine Malecki. I got mul I have five, six, seven articles with those different people. And starting with sometimes even stay in the course of what they did their dissertation on. Um, and you know, I've written 20 some books and a few other guidebooks and things like that and articles. And, and so um, there's no doubt you have to have something that motivates you and you have to have a passion for a topic. And there's several topics I've got a passion for. It becomes easier to write. The, because you admittedly are leaning upon what you've learned from your own work. And that sounds very self-centered, but, but you, you get a dose of feedback about your work. Um, nobody gets anything published uh, that I know of. I, I mean, of my hundreds of articles, I think I've had four or five accepted with minimal change. All of them. Revise, resubmit is the most popular. 85% of the manuscripts revise, resubmit. And, um, and if, if you don't get angry, and I used to about that, 
Um, if you don't get angry and you, you get even, <laughs> so to speak, and, and you don't throw the manuscript off to the side and say, I'll get to that next month. I'm not ready to deal with that crap. And if you sort of say, I'm taking it on right now, and right now, because this was fresh in my mind, I spent the time reading it. And I, so I might as well start writing. So what do I do? So, so I'm, I'm, Aubrey, I'm telling you about revisions, but it's a critical thing. This is, I mean, some people will even define writing as revision. <laughs> That's what it, it's a recursive process, just rewrite. Re, well, I'm talking about revisions that are stimulated by reviewers. And I find it very healthy although a little aversive, but very healthy to immediately, literally within an hour, sometimes after a glass, go get a glass of wine to kind of deal with the, the junk that they gave me. But I sit down and I transform all of the feedback that I get. I think this is good advice for students on anything, okay? Feedback isn't designed to be punitive. Feedback's designed to be corrective. And re in some cases, quite reinforcing. But I transform, I create, I have a framework called revision guide. And I, I go down and I list every single thing, even when it's redundant from every, from the associate editor, editor to the reviewers. And then, so that's one column. The second column is how I'm going to respond. And so I do all the cherry pick stuff. I go right through and start making notes about, I don't, I don't make the re revisions yet, but I go through and start interacting with it. And, um, and noting what, where I have to go and what I have to do. So that percolates for a couple of days after I've done that. That's fresh in my mind. And although I haven't mentioned it, uh, I'm, a, I'm a walker in a, in a writer and a thinker, okay? And those things actually can all be done at one time. <laughs> so um, I take a lot of ideas with me um, when I get sick and tired of looking at this computer screen and go out there and walk for 45 minutes. And I almost always come back with an answer. Not, all, not always, but almost always come back with an answer to a problem I took with me. Um, so I know that I know it's not necessarily popular and people sort of say you should turn off and get, get away and go relax. That actually, I find it relaxing. I find problem solving relaxing because um, uh, I think it feeds some of my my personality, I, I have two characteristics that are becoming more and more clear cut as older I get. One is I'm uh, relatively impatient. And two is I love closure. So as a writer, um, that actually says, I'm going to engage you. Uh, I'm going to uh, produce and get engaged in a revision process. So um, it, may, it may sound just like a Nike commercial, just do it. I mean, it is the, the hardest part of writing is getting started. Absolutely the hardest part of writing is getting started. So I've, I've figured out, you've heard me talk a little bit about this. I do things around momentum, writing momentum. And I stop in the middle of a paragraph instead of completing a thought, even though I like closure, I like closure at the end of the whole thing. So I know right, I, I can pick right up and you get writing because that allows me to have momentum along the way. Um, I, I do a lot of explicit, because I write with other people, I make dates in saying, this is when I'm gonna have something done. I make commitments to myself and to other people. And I miss some of them, but, but not very many. And conversely, it also creates a model for other people to work with me. So we both get momentum. And, and you know, it's, it's like a relay race and you write something and you hand it off. I had a time, I had a time where I was doing work um, in Australia at Australian Catholic University. And one of my, I was hired, ASU supported me doing this with my consulting days. And I was hired to help uh, some postdocs and junior faculty be research productive. So I actually did a mini course on the scholarly writing course for eight postdocs. And we did writing from long distance. But what's really cool because of the time zone change, someone was always writing. 
So you know, I, I would sleep and then I'd get up first thing in the morning and I'd have a, a part of the manuscript and I'd write and send it back. And they'd, they were sleeping and it, it was incredible. It was absolutely, I'm going, this is, I can really see how, you know, 24 seven writing machines. Um, now I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but, but, but there's a process that um, it, it's in some ways it's really simple. Um, I think everyone knows it, but the, uh, Procrastination is a is a bad thing uh, in anybody uh, for almost anything that you raise your hand and say I want to do and I need to do you better do it and um, I'm I'm not suggesting I'm superhuman on this I have my moments where I don't want to do it but I also know that if I start it it will be better it's aversive not to get started on it so that's that's kind of that's the process and I like I said I I know where I'm going in terms of the thought units and when you have other people who are really smart people to work with and bring content knowledge to it then there's quite a synergy between that I can help people navigate where they're going well what you've said about uh you know, just do it, right? It's something that really resonates with me. Something I've been thinking about a lot is this sort of interplay for me personally between discipline and motivation because I've realized that I've started these projects that I'm incredibly fascinated by and I really like to work on them, yet I wasn't making any progress with them because I was waiting to be motivated to work on them. And then I was getting this anxiety because I wasn't feeling oh, yeah. <laughs> yet as soon as I actually started working on them and being disciplined with myself and my collaborators and, you know, actually doing the work, it's amazing how much better I felt, how much or more organized I was and how much progress I actually make. And, yeah. you know, it's, something that I think is important. I think everyone gets there in their own way, you know, creating that kind of work model for themselves. But I think that that just really resonated with me because that's an experience that I've had in the past yeah. six months. Yeah. I, I remember Aubrey, when I was a uh, junior faculty, <laughs> um, and particularly I, I can envision myself actually at the university of Nebraska Lincoln in my, in the house I had there, I, I thought I needed um, uh, writing blocks. I need. I took out a calendar and I said on um, Tuesday morning between five a.m. I'm a morning guy. I'm, I'm up most mornings before four o'clock. Uh, some people are night people. Obviously, I can't be a night person and be a morning. But I do my best writing, my best thinking between four in the morning and eight in the morning. Um, no interruptions to speak of. Um, but I I also always thought when I was a junior faculty, I needed writing blocks. And maybe I did because I had children in that. Maybe I needed to isolate um, uh, a bit, but I've kind of given that up, um, that the notion that uh, like make an appointment with yourself to go sit down and write. That, um, uh, I, um, I, I, don't, I don't frame it that way anymore. No, I, I've got fewer responsibilities than I used to as a, as a parent and when kids are growing up. And so um, I, I have every day to write, uh, basically, if I want to. But I think it's all about uh, having, uh, having a program uh, in your mind about what you're writing, not a schedule as a appointment. Um, but uh, it, I mean, I did say I make dates with people. I make deadlines, but I don't create blocks of time. I just sit down and, and work through it. I like to have two or three things going at a time. And I do think you have to um, eventually. I think obviously the, the, at the beginning, at the beginning years, it is really hard uh, to have more than two things going. Um, I, I have the advice I have for junior people, and I've said this to most of my graduate students over the years is make sure your dissertation is able to be carved up into two manuscripts. Because if you go on to an academic career, your first year, I don't think you're going to collect any new data. Um, so you're going to have either an extant data set that you're going to be able to dig deeper in, or you're going to be able to uh, massage those two areas of that dissertation and get them out so that you can start having some, because one of the manuscripts will take six months to review, should, should never, but it will. 
and the other one will take you know two months and then you'll have to do revisions and you'll have nothing to show for in the first year you go and that'll look look and feel bad okay uh it will and so you just so that what you have to have in your hip pocket you have to have you know knowledge about an extant data set and i mean nowadays and can you i'm, I'm just I really don't know what the ramifications of COVID and pandemic is. My work is almost all school-based work. Um, and I, I can only imagine as a junior faculty, the effects that would have on me because it would probably mean a year, year and a half, maybe two years of no new data. Um, unless you have some of these large national data sets that you're conversant with, early childhood longitudinal study comes to mind, which by the way, the SSRS, that early social skills instrument, is, is basically not all of the items, but the large majority of the items in kids' social skills in the early childhood longitudinal study are my items. And so it's cool. It's kind of, uh, and I've never done any research with that data set, but I have some students now, some of my former students, I should say, they're faculty members doing work with that. And I think that's a really smart thing to do is to have that an extant data set kind of you can travel along with you wherever you're at you can keep mining that data um and it's also the notion of teamwork because it just it it really does today it's a rarity to see a manuscript published by fewer than two people or three people i mean um and it it, it speaks to people joining forces to i think advance um i think knowledge some of it too has to do with Complementary skill sets, analytics, of, data analytics have become pretty sophisticated. Back in the day when I was doing it, I could do everything. I could do all the analysis, do all the writing. Uh, that's not true anymore uh, at all. Um, uh, I can I can do the basic analyses, but there's there's too many sophisticated sort of boutique methods to deal with this special situation, that special situation. So you really do need to, to, um, to partner up and stay conversant. Um, I think we're in a rich environment in SSFD. I think we have a lot of talented methodologists and stat, stat, stat savvy folks, uh, which is really critical, I think. Um, uh, and, and, and the earlier you say, I don't know and I don't understand something, teach me, the better you'll be as a, as a researcher. It's a, it's a very powerful, Writing, doing research and writing, getting the feedback and going through is a very powerful learning experience if you let it happen. Um, it, it really is. Good fun. I love that, Steve. Uh, you know, one thing that I really admire about you is that you are someone who is constantly learning. And I think that that is what generally draws people to academia is because we are usually, as a collective, people who enjoy learning. Yeah, right, yeah. Unfortunately, I think along the way, there are some people who like to learn, but they also don't like to admit when they don't know something. And I think that being able to hold on to, you know, a willingness to accept new ideas and to be a little bit vulnerable to say, you know, I don't know this, will you teach me? And accept no. mentorship at all ages is something that's very valuable. Huge, um, it's a huge issue, uh, Albert, it really is. It's, I think it's more dangerous to pretend you know something yeah. <laughs> when you don't know it. It really is. It, 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 it really is. It's um, your ignorance will show quickly on that. I'd rather pro proclaim my ignorance and, and have and, and have someone help teach me through it. This I, I'm teaching. I, I, this is another thing too. Um, you, you know, you're never too old to learn. And uh, um, I, I got into a situation this year that I was not happy with. Okay, so this is sort of self-disclosure. Um, I was asked to teach um, uh, a course that I've never taught before. So there's always a first time, I guess you got to do that. But look, I mean, I've been at this 40 years. I don't want to teach a course I haven't taught before. Um, but I did. So I'm teaching undergraduate uh, 337 early intervention, uh, early childhood intervention. And wow, what a great course it is for me. <laughs> now, we'll wait and see if it's a great course for students. I think it is incredible. And, and, and so it's incredible in that, and it speaks to this continuing learning. I, I, I would raise my hand and said, you know, I know quite a bit about 
three, four, five year olds. I know almost nothing except my having my own kids between the ages of zero and two. Really deep knowledge about that and what's going on there. And um, and so and I know a lot about intervention, but mostly with older kids, not younger kids. I know a lot about schools, but not families. And um, actually, I I know more than I thought I did. But I learned a lot about early childhood. And there, I mean, I'm just, I want to spread the word. Many of you know this, but there's a, the, the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard has got incredible, absolutely incredible materials on, the, on zero to five, particularly zero to three, uh, um, uh, development of children. And, and particularly around aspects of stress, stress management, brain uh, structure, brain uh, um, architecture. And I've had to learn that. And um, it has been, um, I think, uh, eye-opening to me in that I knew down the pipeline what was going on with four or five, six, seven-year-olds in terms of some social issues. This is critical. And there's a there's a critical space there. Um, I, I mean, I'm not telling anyone who knows if this, but but the research is getting very good in terms of uh, brain physiology and 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 health and well-being. Um, and the longitudinal work is so so powerful now about the the health of of. Of, of middle age and adults that deal with how they dealt with stress. If you get a chance, go play on this site. It's a game. Go play the resilience game. I had nothing to do with developing it, but it's a required, it was a required activity in that class. And you got to do the pretest before you read anything, play the resilience game, and you, you see all these kids in the park and you have to figure them out. And, and figure out what they need to, to move forward. And, and, and then they apply the research to your solution to give you an idea of if it was effective or not. So it's, it's, it is a game, but it's, it's a scientific game. And then you can do the post-test. And my students in this class did it. I, and this was one of the first events they did in the class. So it's set to stage. And um, it was terrific. And, and I learned a ton from it. Um, and I've played the game multiple times and I'm not a, I'm not a gamer guy I, that like, I would hate doing computer games, but this was an intellectual game that had a research base behind the decisions. And so it was an incredible, literally portal into this area. And, um, I learned a lot and I encourage people to, um, to keep being open to things. And of course, I had to do it. Someone said, you have to teach this course. <laughs> so, so I did. But um, I'm making the absolute best of it from my perspective. And um, this is where that new book is coming from, Aubrey. There's, so I, I try to start every lecture with a very um, applied concept. And so um, there's a there's a history of mine in the clinical side where I did work and I've written a few articles about a few, few assessment manuals and intervention manuals where I talk about think rules. So my, and maybe this is a great place to end. I don't know how long you want to go to Jim, but that this is uh, these, these think rules are really, you try to boil things down and keep it simple. So I try to start each lecture with a think rule and I try to end each lesson. And, and I, I wanna elaborate on this so it doesn't sound wrong with a kiss, okay? So the think rule, the number one think rule is think solution. Now this is an intervention class, think solution. The subtitle of that is avoid admiring problems, okay? We spend a lot of times admiring problems. Now you have to understand the problem. I'm all for that, <laughs> but think solution, which it, in some ways, uh, it, I think I look into this, Aubrey, and it's kind of like my writing, know where you're going, know the 15 thought units, and then you can back map from that. And, and all your thoughts are about how do I, you know, 
that, that solution is viable until proven not viable. And so think solution. And then the, the, the ending examples of like KISS rules are, not KISS rules, KISS lists. KISS stands for keep it simple, Steve, keep it simple, stupid, whatever S you want to use. But little things like this, here, um, here are two, two little interventions. So I like to do little intervention building blocks. Here's two interventions for you, Aubrey, um, because stress, okay, stress is really uh, a killer. It's a killer. If uh, toxic stress, so long durations of stress in children's lives, stop brain development, undermine it. Um, and in adults development, it's problematic too. So we wanna learn how to cope and tolerate stress. So here are two simple things. The first intervention is breathing, right? And so we teach people the following. This is not unique to me. This is, a, this is established science. So it's smell the flower. Hold it for a three count, blow out the candle, okay? Do that five times in a row. And I guarantee you, guarantee you the physiological effects of that is you become more relaxed. You will become more relaxed, okay? Here's the next one, research-based. You do this really well, Aubrey, too. I'm sure you're doing it right now. <laughs> Smiling. Smiling triggers neuropeptides in the brain. Neuropeptides trigger dopamine. That's healthy stuff. That's stress reducing stuff, okay? Here's a fact. Here's a, here's a funny fact. Guys my age, I'm not typical though. Guys my age, I'm not gonna speak for women. They, they do this a little more than, guy, than men. Smile about 20 times a day. It's sad. They smile about 20 times a day. A two-year-old smiles 400 times a day. A two-year-old is happier. A two-year-old is continuing to develop his or her brain and they're reducing stress. So, you know, we're gonna all have stress. We all know how to breathe and do that breathe and we all know how to smile. If you do those things, you're on your way. <laughs> How about that? Steve, that was fantastic. I think that was a really lovely note to wrap things on. Uh, I So the way that the show typically ends is that I like to end with some deep questions. And oh. these are just to get a bit of your personal philosophy. The point of these questions is really just to answer them quickly, you know, and don't put a whole lot of thought into it. I really just want to know off the cuff what your reaction to these are. So are you ready, Steve? Okay, go for it. <laughs> All right, Steve. I'm nervous first... now. I'm nervous, Aubrey. <laughs> well, my first question, well, remember to breathe, Steve. <laughs> So my first question is, what are you learning right now? Well, I think, I, I mean, I hate to be redundant. I'm learning about stress. I'm learning about managing stress. And I think I've done it, but it's been more kind of second nature. And I'm, I'm learning about the tools of doing that and translating that into practice. You're also getting some exposure therapy right now oh, yeah. uh, in a stressful situation, getting yeah, these. Yeah, problems. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I used to use imaging and, 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 and I, I believe in physical activity. My walking is a stress reducer, getting away from a computer set. I think that's a really important thing in this world. And man, I mean, this past year, we've been, you know, in really in a very stressful world. So um, I think. Managing stress is a huge part of, of productivity too. Yeah. All right, Steve. My second question is this. If you woke up tomorrow and found that you were back at the first day of graduate school, but with all the knowledge that you have now, would you do anything differently? You know, um, it, I, that's a hard question. Um, I think it's a really hard question. It is. Yeah, I, I, I think 
Um, I can't really think of anything I regret. So that would, I mean, that would be kind of where you'd start and sort of say, boy, I should have gone that path. I should have worked with that person. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, and and you, maybe you make your own luck and fortune. Um, maybe it just happens. Um, but no, I, I don't think I would. I think it would be great to be armed with some of the knowledge I have now and just go deeper. Um, I think it would make each of those situations, many of those situations, even more effective learning events. Yeah. Yeah. I, think no, I, I, I really love the profession I'm in. Um, I really do. I think, I'm, again, I kind of consider myself fortunate. Um, I, I, I very much enjoy doing what I do. Yeah. I think the love you have for your career is really evident. So I think that was a great answer, Steve. And now uh, our last question to lead us out on is, Steve, what is one rule you would want everyone to follow? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I uh, you know, a lot of, it's not very sexy um, a rule. It's, it's really mundane, but it's plan ahead. Yeah. <laughs> that, I love be that. Plan, be planful, plan ahead. Um, and, you know, you can frame it as think solution. I, I like, I just like people to have a plan and, um, and make it explicit. Then you can help, you can join, you can, um, you can a, a, be accountable. You can, you, there's so many things that happen when you have a plan or have a goal, I guess is another thing, but a plan is a little richer than a goal because you, a lot of people have goals, but they don't have the plan to accomplish the goal the plan. That was beautifully said, Steve. Once again, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on today. It really has just been such a pleasure to listen to you and learn from you. And I really think that everyone listening is also appreciative of that. Yeah, well, good. I hope so. I hope, you know, it'd be great if one or two people heard that and said, I think I can learn something. <laughs> All right, doesn't. But it's so much fun seeing you again, Aubrey. I, I really enjoyed it myself. So thank you for inviting me and thanks for the opportunity. So. Wonderful. All right. All right. Once again, thank you, Dr. Smith. And uh, all right. Goodbye, all right. everyone. Have a great day. See you, Aubrey. Bye bye. Connect with us and get access to all of our podcasts by visiting the Sanford School dot asu dot edu forward slash podcast where you will also find links to all of our social media channels this conversation has come to an end but our work here continues <laughs>